There is a very big meeting happening this Tuesday, the 19th of July in Washington, D.C., and this is going to really have some big effects on the uranium market. We're going to talk about who all is attending. There is 100 plus. I have a list of who all is going. It's the NEI Nuclear Fuel Supply Forum. We'll also go over the topics. I have a list of exactly what they're talking about. I have recently just collected a lot of this data, so we're going to go over this meeting. I have actually went to one of these meetings in 2020, a couple years ago, when it was online. It was all a digital forum. Now, this is actually going to be physically held there in Washington, D.C., very close to the Capitol, all the monuments. But it is a six-hour meeting, and there is a lot of very important people going to be there. And this meeting is very important this year because it is unlike any of the previous meetings. Some of the things that they're going to discuss are very big for the uranium and nuclear energy fuel market. And a lot of the people attending, you'll be surprised, 100-plus people have already said they're going. And some of those people, the biggest companies, obviously, in uranium, and some representatives. So the government, obviously... People, leaders are going to be there, leaders of companies. So we're going to go into this. The Department of Energy's Dr. Catherine Huff, she's going to be first opening up, speaking. And she is very pro-uranium, obviously pro-nuclear. I really like her. She's brand new. I think she brings a lot to the table. She's very smart. And she's already talked about the U.S. supply chain and how there needs to be a big funding. Now, she's the head of this, what they call Tiger Team. She's really, I think, going to help out the uranium market. Now, the, the next thing is, this is a really big one here, disentangling the nuclear fuel supply chain, geopolitics comes for uranium. Now, S&P Global, they are going to give a presentation, and I just so happen to have the presentation, and we're going to go through this presentation, and this is what they're going to talk about. A lot of this stuff is going to be eye-opening for the hundreds of plus people. We are going to get into exactly who's coming, and of course, it is the heads of some massive companies and it's going to probably surprise a lot of people who all is actually going to be there. And remember, not everyone's putting their name down and listing this. So it's going to be interesting to see who all really does show up. The global supply chain for uranium is at risk. And this is why I think we're going to see $200 very quickly. That in the world of nuclear energy, things rarely move quickly. Nuclear power reactors often take 10 years or more to license and build and then can operate for six more decades. So obviously that's usually the West. The East can do it in five years, four to five years. Japan, about four years. They can get a construction done and a nuclear power plant. Nuclear fuel is only replaced in a reactor at most once a year or every 18 to 24 months. Uranium can take more than a year to be mined, milled, converted to gas, enriched into uranium-235, and fabricated into fuel bundles that are lowered into reactors during refueling. So while the impact of Russia this last February invasion of Ukraine on the world of nuclear fuel was not immediate, by nuclear standards, it is proving exceedingly fast. Russia is a key global supplier of nuclear fuel, especially to the Eastern European countries that operate Soviet-designed nuclear plants, for which Russia state nuclear company is often the only supply option. Its long history as a reliable and low-cost supplier has made Russia the source for almost a third of all uranium conversion services and 40% of enrichment globally. So I think having all of these heads of companies, these you know nuclear fuel traders, having everyone together, I think it's going to light a spark in the uranium market, the nuclear fuel enrichment market for the U.S. We could see a lot happen after this. Even in the faraway U.S., Russia supplies a fifth of enrichment to nuclear operators. Reaction to the war has been marked by desire to stop sending money to Russia for its commodities, but a concern that cutting off the taps of Russian fuel could bring chaos to the markets and end users. That is true in uranium as well, which was exempt from the initial rounds of U.S. sanctions. However, there is a growing chorus of legislators in the U.S. and Europe calling for bans on the use of Russian nuclear fuel components, mined uranium, converted uranium hexafluoride, and enriched uranium. Every dollar we give to the Russian state, I believe, supports the murderers in Ukraine. The... Uh do you anticipate that this administration will also ban imports of Russian uranium? If such a ban were in place, it is our role in DOE to ensure that there is a commercial viable supply uh, to ensure that there is a continuous operation for our nuclear plants. I, too, would agree that the Russian aggression really highlights the need for ensuring that we can onshore 
those capabilities. As you just said, our ability to onshore those capabilities, the United States, we have 93 operating commercial reactors. The reactor is almost completely reliant on imports of uranium. Our commercial reactors import nearly half the uranium from Russia, its allies, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, you, you well know this. So you believe uranium produced here in the U.S., whether in private, state, or federal lands, really can play that critical role in weaning off uh, weaning our commercial reactors off of Russian and foreign uranium. I think it is critically important that we wean ourselves off of unstable, untrustworthy sources of our critical fuels, including uranium. The U.S. Department of Energy established a Tiger team to study the impacts of such a ban and developed a plan to ensure security of supply. In early June, the DOE started briefing congressional staff on a plan that could cost between $3.5 billion and $4 billion to secure a domestic nuclear fuel supply chain to replace Russian vendors. That's that Biden administration $4.3 billion they're looking for. It's very likely to come. In the late June, there were reports that changes in Canadian sanction applications that caused shippers to back out of plans to bring uranium enriched in Russia from the port of St. Petersburg to the U.S., sending utility recipients scrambling to find alternate supply. Nuclear industry officials perceive a sea change, a move away from a vendor who was involved in every aspect of the fuel cycle, enjoyed a good reputation for its technology and reliability, and often offered the lowest prices. Spot prices of enrichment services where Russia's state-owned company 10X is the largest global player have climbed 65% since the start of the year, as buyers sought to move away from the Russian sources, Canadian uranium company Cameco said similar price increases could come to uranium conversion in the price of U-308 concentrate that is mostly traded form of uranium. It's still early days, but we are seeing what we believe is an unprecedented geopolitical realignment occurring in the nuclear fuel cycle, said Tim, CEO of Cameco. The industry now faces the challenges of a disentangling its supply chain from the dependence of Russian nuclear fuel supply, he said. The disentanglement is being noticed first among the utilities that rely on Russian 10X for enriched uranium. Instead of buying mined uranium conversion and enrichment separately, chemical officials said during their earnings call that they expect it to move backwards among the supply chain to include conversion and mined uranium soon. So as we know, the U308 spot price, we hit that big high in April. And it has since dropped just slightly, but a lot of those long-term SWU, enrichment, everything else is up. Obviously, long-term prices, they're holding a lot stronger. The spot uranium is really going to be dictated by traders right now. Small traders just going in, selling just little sources. It's not, you know, usually it's around 100,000 pounds, the minimum. But uh, I don't think this is anything to be alarmed about. So Cameco has delayed deliveries from a joint Venture mine that's in Kazakhstan until a delivery route that avoids passage through Russia can be confirmed. So Kazakhstan's Kazanoprom supplies 40% of the world's U-308, much of which is delivered for conversion and enrichment or goes by rail to St. Petersburg where it's shipped to the West. So Cameco said cargo insurance for such shipments is being canceled, spurring its decision to avoid that route. So we did have the Canadian government actually give like a waiver for this to happen for certain ships that it wouldn't be breaking the law. But even with that waiver, these companies are still having issues and you're seeing a supply chain disruption already. So competitors have said that they saw an immediate impact from nuclear operators relying heavily on the Russian field suppliers like 10X. U.S.-based nuclear reactor company Westinghouse said it is almost immediately began intensive discussions with Eastern European nuclear plant operators following the invasion. Those vendors operate Soviet designed units and often signed agreements to get all of their fuel from Rosatom for decades. For many years, there were no alternate vendors for such reactors. So Westinghouse actually started supplying Ukraine their 15 reactors for nuclear fuel several years ago, but that's Rosatom. They're the ones that still been a principal fuel supplier during the years of conflict between the two countries. So we've already seen issues there. Now, nuclear industry executives say that they expect a series of deals such as announcement last month that the Czech utility will buy nuclear fuel from Westinghouse in France 
sharply reducing reliance on Rosatom. Definitely the current situation in Central and Eastern Europe offers opportunities that will be long lasting, Westinghouse CEO Patrick said. And when he was asked if there would be any opportunities in nuclear energy, the changes would take years to develop and said this was a case of quicker resolution. Significant actions are expected in the coming months, not years. And that is lightning fast in the nuclear world. So that is actually what they're going to be going over. We just went over it here. Now, if you go down the rest of the day, just two more things. The geopolitics in Russia, Kazakhstan, and the Eurasia region. This is uh, Susan Eisenhower. She's like the great granddaughter of President Eisenhower. Now, this as well, this is probably going to go into a lot of the geopolitical issues that they're already having in Kazakhstan and not even related to Russia. Inflation, possibly. These are very important things that we're discussing, and it could have big impacts for the uranium market. Now, if you look at the 2021, the one that I attended, a lot of this information, it was very dry. It wasn't really major impacts on the, the market itself. I think these are a lot bigger that we're talking about today with Russia and Kazakhstan. Now, this is very interesting. The people attending, there's over 100 already listed. Now, these are the big companies and who actually is attending. So we've seen, if you look through here, BWX Technologies, the vice president, we see Cameco, pretty much majority of the people at Cameco, their marketing, they're going to be there. We've seen Centris Energy, their sales, Constellation Energy. We've seen big utilities, Converden, the president and chief executive officer. We've seen Denison Mines, director of commercial and corporate development, Dominion Energy, nuclear field procurement, consulting engineer. We've seen Duke Energy. Encore Energy is going to be there, Energy Harbor Corp, Energy USA Incorporated. We're seeing Ido National Laboratory. We're seeing traders. We're seeing uh, Japanese fuel traders, uranium traders. There's a bunch of lawyers there. We're seeing uh, Goviex, Chief Uranium Marketing is going to be there. NEI, all pretty much everyone from the NEI is going to be there. Arano, they're the ones actually sponsoring this. Uh, New Core Energy, President's going to be there. Pacific Gas and Electric Company, their nuclear fuel programs manager. We're seeing Peninsula Energy, non-executive director, uh, Paladin Energy, vice president of sales and marketing, U.S. Department of Energy. We're seeing what I said earlier, uh, Dr. Huff, a bunch of them are going to be there. And 10X, they actually have the 10X USA, director of business and development. We're seeing UR Energy, chief executive officer. UEC, we're seeing the executive vice president. He's the president of the Uranium Producers of America as well, right? Uh, Urenco Limited. We're seeing uh, UXC, their president's going to be there. And a bunch of traders, probably some fund managers could also be there, there in Washington. This is only a six-hour ordeal, but it is very important. And also House of Representatives, District of Virginia, she's actually going to be there. She's really cool. She was in the Navy. She joined about nine years before I did on the 19th. It's, I think, going to spark a fire in the uranium sector. Now, these are all the events pretty much in nuclear and uranium. And there's a very, very big one that we haven't seen like this for a while. And this is going to be held in Las Vegas. This is one that I would like to actually go to October 16th through the 18th. This is going to have everybody there. And this is also going to pretty much most every uranium company I think is going to be there. The International Uranium Fuel Seminar. And, you know, there's a multi-day event. And uh, this, this one right here, I think uranium... Stocks as well are going to see an uptick, not just because we're seeing refueling of the nuclear reactors in America. We see spot market, the seasonality, but you get a lot of t a lot of investors going to these things and you get a lot of talk. And I think this actually specific event like this was when some of the big investors in Paladin in the early 2000s, they went to one of these and a lot of big investors actually invested like in Paladin, I think Rick, Rick Rule. Uh, Bob Healy, he was the one that invested 300,000 in Paladin. And, uh, it was when it was like two cents and they were actually at one of these. And, uh, he actually ended up that 300,000 turned into $417 million. He turned in about 120 million from two cents to what? $9 and 40 cents when Paladin shares hit. And then he, he leveraged like four X from there. All that he leveraged through debt, bought other companies and did really well. So it's pretty interesting who you can see at these events. Uh, I will not be attending the one on the 19th. I will not be. It's just a six hour thing. 
And most of the stuff we already went over, they're going to be discussing. I keep you updated with that already. Now, uranium, we're looking at uranium here. The price of uranium has pulled back some, but as I said earlier, a lot of these traders are coming in there. It's nothing to be alarmed about, in my opinion. We're still in a good place. I think 55 by 56 bucks by the, you know, October when the field cycling starts, the refueling, I think that's where we need to be. And I think we could break out very soon. The uranium charts are still looking about the same. UEC still bouncing off that trend line I've had for a long time. Most of these look very similar. UEC and Cameco usually look the same. And then Denison and Energy Fuels look almost identical. Remember, these are leverage plays on the price of uranium. And when uranium goes up, I think these are going to see better days. But they're looking good in the past couple years, way better than a lot of those stocks in the NASDAQ and Dow that are down 60, 70, 80, 90% this year. These pullbacks happen, but it's very good if you're trading. And if you're a long-term investor, then you really don't look at it every day. You don't, nothing to be worried about, in my opinion. But commodities, crude oil jumped back up 98 bucks. It jumped a couple percent. And I think that you're going to see commodities, they really... There's no reason that these, in my opinion, should be down, especially uranium. I think that we're going to see probably by fall, we're going to see a lot of these prices up a lot higher. You know, inflation's higher. Yes, energy prices recently have gone down in the last month, but in my opinion, it's going to go back up very quickly. I think a lot of this is just short-term volatility, but long-term, these prices got to go up. So we'll see how uranium stocks do this week. I think that there's going to be a lot more volume. We've had really low volume recently. And after this, I think it's going to create that spark I talked about in the government. And it's going to get everyone coming together. And hopefully, a lot of good things happen for the U.S. enrichment side. Now, if you have any questions, write them out below. In the next video I'm going to do, I'm going to answer all of those in the next video. I'll answer them to the best of my abilities. Maybe I'll do some research, obviously. If it's not off the top of my head, you can get my opinion on stuff. Looking forward to doing that video. So if you like these videos, hit the like and subscribe button below. And be on the lookout for the next video.